Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning for Emory uh, Winship Grand Rounds. If you're an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive CME credit for the hour for attending, the login information can be found in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar or CME login, please send Julie Hawkins an email or drop a note via the chat feature. We are so excited to welcome Dr. Michael Lowe here today. Dr. Lowe received his MD from Georgetown University and, sir, and came to Emory for his general surgery residency. He served as chief resident before going on to a fellowship in, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. He returned to Emory and we were so excited to have us, him join the melanoma and skin cancer team, uh, but today he's going to talk to us about his other clinical endeavor as director, a clinical director of the Morningside program. I will say in 2019, when the Dean reached out to me to discuss Michael Lowe, I, I got a little nervous. The Dean usually doesn't <laughs> talk about new faculty members very much. And so I, I was for sure that he had gotten himself in trouble. But the reality is, is, is the Dean saw the rising star that's in uh, Dr. Lowe and has really um, been transformative. And uh, we're so excited that he took this position in Morningside and I look forward to really learning more about uh, the program uh, that we can all participate in and, and lucky to have it here at Emory. So with no further ado, thank you for attending and uh, Dr. Lowe, I'll let you take it over. Thank you very much, Reiki. That's very kind of you. Um, yet it's unexpected to get a call from the Dean about your colleague. And so, yes, it was good news, not bad. So I appreciate you uh, offering your support on, on behalf of, of me and the team. So thank you to the Winship, um, faculty for the invitation to present here at Winship Grand Rounds. And to, uh, to, sorry, switching my. Dr. Lowe, speak up a little bit. We're having a hard time hearing you. Sorry, I'm switching over to my AirPods because there's construction. So hopefully you can hear me and not the construction. Um, it's, it's an absolute privilege to be a part of the Winship team and um, getting my screen up here, apologies. Um, and, and it's much a privilege to be a part of the, the Morningside Center for Innovative and Affordable Medicine. So, so I'm hopeful in this hour to uh, present to you essentially a 30,000 foot view of the center, um, the, the purpose of the, of the center, the goals of the center, and, and how we can work with you as, as uh, thoughtful and uh, groundbreaking investigators at Winship to bring some of our concepts and hopefully a lot of your concepts into reality to transform the way that we provide cancer care, both here at Winship and, and around our community. First, I must start, uh, since this is, I, I think, the, the first grand round since the formal announcement of the leadership change at Winship. I want to congratulate Ram on, on being appointed the executive director of Winship. Uh, He's a groundbreaking researcher and uh, a thoughtful intellect. Uh, Graham, we, we support you and look forward to working with you as, as we bring Winship into a, a new generation of, of uh, research and uh, innovative patient care. And special thanks to Adam Marcus for uh, being the interim director. Uh, you've provided uh, significant support to us in this transition and continue to do so. Um, and we're grateful for your work, not only as, as uh, an incredible scientist, but also as, as a leader for the program. So uh, thank you again for, for both of you and your support at Morningside Center. And, and we're looking forward to continue our working relationship with the Winship leadership. Uh, I am here on behalf of an incredible team of, of experts in their field. Um, Vikas Sakatme and his wife, Vigila Sakatme, who I think has joined us today, 
um, this is really their brainchild. This is this is decades of work on their part to to bring uh, repurposed medicines to the care of patients, and it's been an honor working with them. Uh, they're they're brilliant, they're thoughtful, and they're engaged in this in a way that uh, makes me uh, every day excited to be a part of the team. Uh, Lisa Carlson uh, is the executive administrator um, in the School of Medicine for the research programs. Um, she also, in, in her other hat, uh, is an incredible um, public health expert, uh, past president of the HPA, and uh, just a really, uh, really helpful team member to make sure that we're doing everything the way that we should be doing it. Krista Charon is the Associate Director of Research Projects at the School of Medicine. She is the 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 day-to-day -day, uh, keeping us on track, getting everything done. Um, just a, a real uh, real asset to the team in terms of moving things forward and, and keeping us in line. Um, she's also a regulatory expert and so brings that side of, of her expertise to the team to, again, to make sure that the work that we're doing is, is aligned with the, with the ethical and um, uh, medical principles of research. And Selvi Ramalingan, um, she independently contracts for Morningside. She's an information specialist, uh, has been integral to the work uh, developing our database that I'll share with you in just a few moments. Um, really, really gets the way that technology can, can be an asset to large data sets and how we can and use that technology to, to bring it to, to researchers and to patients. So this is, so this is a, an amazing team and I'm so thankful to be a part of it. And special thanks to, to Ram, who has been a, a really invaluable asset in terms of, of being able to, to pick his brain about concepts and collaborations, particularly with the VA. Um, and so special to Ram as well. So the evolution of the Morningside Center really started again with, with Vikas and Vigila's original nonprofit called Global Cures that was developed back in 2007. When they arrived at Emory uh, in January of 2019, uh, we started, they started the Center for Affordable Medical Innovation at, at Emory and brought in Lisa, uh, Krista, and myself um, to, to build the team. And then after a, uh, a formal donation from the Morningside Foundation. Uh, we changed names to Morningside Center for Innovative and Affordable Medicine, which is the, the current entity uh, that, that I present to you today. So, so what, what are we, why are we here? There's, the problem really is that there remains a large unmet need in medicine, uh, as many therapies are expensive, often toxic, and sometimes only modestly or sometimes even less than modestly effective. And I think we all know that that, that is true. And so their opportunity exists to develop scientifically promising ideas that are currently really just left fallow because they lack sufficient financial incentive. We're going to term these financial orphans. And there's, there's a lot of data or, or source data that we can use to develop these opportunities. And, and this exists in the form of preclinical data, uh, retrospective human data, small case reports, and early studies. But there really aren't any large phase three randomized studies that allow us to say that these financial orphans should be used as standard of care, particularly in, in cancer patients. And so that's really the ultimate goal of, of this center is to bring these medicines into the standard of care for patients with cancer. There are major categories of financial orphans, um, and, and these in general are approved drugs that could be repurposed, an example being propanolol. But we could also uh, think about things like nutraceuticals and lifestyle changes like diet modification. Uh, the majority of the work we've, we've done so far has really been in this approved drug space uh, that, that we can use for repurposing. So this is a typical uh, new drug development pathway. This is, of course, not news to anybody on this, on this uh, meeting. We have a preclinical idea that turns into a promising therapy or novel, novel intervention. And the first real question in the development of that idea is, is there a return on the investment? Is there a patent available? What is the market size for the drug to be developed? Uh, what are the chances of it actually successfully getting to development? And if it does get to development, what is the potential for reimbursement? Now, a lot of therapies never make it through this process, but 
uh, there are quite a few that do. And the majority of them are because they're able to really significantly impact the reimbursement of the maker of the drug. So if there is a return on investment, most of those therapies are channeled through pharma and they result in FDA approval through clinical trials. But there, if they're really a return on investment, if propanolol costs less than a dollar to give, there's no return on that investment. And really, so there's no financial incentive to pursue that drug um, as a new indication for it. When we talk about existing drugs like propanolol, there's a plenty of preclinical data that supports its use in cancer care. There are case reports that say it's safe and effective in, in, in reducing the risk of, of cancer uh, burden. There's a large epidemiologic studies that say that exposure to these drugs can really uh, alter the risk of development or progression of cancers. So they're very promising ideas, but again, there's no return on investment because they lack the financial incentive to develop. So we've recognized the problem and the, the question really remains, how are we going to address it? And so there, there, are, there are really three, three main buckets of, of, of people that may be able to address this. The first is nonprofits like Global, Global Cures and the Morningside Center. And there are other uh, international nonprofits that are, that are looking at repurposing the anti cannabis cures within REACH uh, Cures Within Reach, uh, good friends are, are, is led by good friends of, of the Sukatmates. And you'll often see uh, RFPs brought from Cures Within Reach to our faculty. And I strongly encourage um, faculty across the, the Emory campus to, to consider funding opportunities with Cures Within Reach. Um, federal opportunities uh, through NCATS, the FDA, CMS, the FDA has a particular interest in repurposing of drugs, not necessarily in cancer specifically, but broadly, uh, they hosted a, a meeting uh, about two years ago now and brought in key players across the, the, the federal and academic worlds. Um, not much participation with pharma, unfortunately, but to really bring everybody into the room together to say, how can we, how can we address this more globally? And then, of course, academia, which is why we're here. Uh, we as academic leaders uh, can can really forge this forward um, because of the ability to run trials through uh, the mechanisms that exist within uh, the space like Winship. So what does the clinical development of financial uh, orphans bring to the table? The advantages are that they're affordable. Uh, the majority of them are, are very low in terms of toxicity or, or side effect profile, and they're widely available. Any MD can write a prescription for these drugs. It doesn't require a specialization in medical oncology, hematology, surgical oncology, or radiation oncology to write a prescription for propanolol. There are, of course, these challenges of competing interventions and prioritization. There are very few patients that walk into Emory who are treatment naive and, and, and available to receive upfront therapies. There's been are, the majority of those patients are receiving interventions out in the community and oftentimes present to, to Winship in the refractory setting. It's also difficult to recruit investigators. Uh, there are the competing interests of the investigators in terms of clinical time, um, in terms of competing pharma uh, industry trials that pull time away from investigator initiated trials. So the, the normal challenges of, of getting an investigator initiated trial started. And then of course funding, who's gonna pay for all of this? Uh, there is very little, if any, interest from the, from the industry. And so this really is dependent on nonprofits, academia, and hopefully the federal government. So this brings us to the idea behind repurposing of drugs. There are a large array of very common drugs that have significant amounts of, of preclinical or epidemi epidemiologic data to support their use in cancer care. Uh, some of you have even run trials with some of these drugs here at Winship, uh, metformin, ARBs, uh, statins are really gaining interest. Uh, NSAIDs, uh, antidepressants, and beta blockers. These are very common drugs. Oftentimes, the majority of your patients may be on some or all of these drugs. Um, and we can, can really use that as a potential for uh, augmenting current cancer therapies. There are also many uncommon drugs that we wouldn't typically uh, have patients on or even consider using, um, melatonin, uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, some of the azoles. These are agents that 
will require much more robust uh, preclinical data, but also early safety and um, tolerability data to <clears throat> ensure that these are safe combinations moving forward. And then of course, there are current cancer therapies that have either uh, fallen out of favor or have been replaced by uh, more efficacious uh, cancer therapies. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Kuchikar is, is wincing at IL-2, but there are, there are therapeutic options that we could repurpose that are cancer drugs even within the cancer space in hopes of reaching um, additional patients. So there's this larger scientific framework that we're using that focuses on cancer as sort of an ecosystem that's, that's really affected by three main um, aspects of tumor response, the adaptation, the injury, and the immune response. And each one of these, these three um, aspects of, of cancer response impact the way we think about what drugs could be used for repurposing. So this is, a, again, a 30,000 foot view of the way we think about cancer. There, there are cell biology and tumor immunology experts on this call that would be shamed by this very simplistic overview of, of cancer response in the human body. But again, this is really a starting point to think about how we can change the way that we think about uh, treatment for cancer. So in general, the scientific framework of cancer is that mutations give tumor cells a growth advantage over non-tumor cells, which results in uncontrolled growth. The adaptive response of the body um, leads to uh, either cell survival, in which there's progression, um, and if there's inadequate adaptive response, it oftentimes results in cell death. The result of cell death, of course, is an injury response, which can oftentimes result in growth factors, um, immune suppression that results in, in tumor growth and metastases. Or if there is an adequate adaptive response, there tends to be cell survival, which again results in tumor growth and metastasis. In order to, to address this problem, we oftentimes give cancer treatments that exacerbates this cycle of adaptive responses, injury responses, and tumor growth and metastases. And so how can we address other points in this pathway that will sort of counteract the effects that are resulting from the use of some of these cancer treatments, particularly cytotoxic therapies? Honing in a little bit more on the injury response without getting into too much detail, an injury results in uh, platelet activation, which results in unfavorable uh, tumor environment um, because of, of platelets, mast cells, and uh, catecholamines. Um, infection can significantly alter the course of the immune response related to the tumor. And oftentimes this injury response results in immune suppression, these sort of uh, proactive or negative, negative signals um, MDSCs, Tregs, and M2 macrophages. And all of this results in, in tissue regeneration and remodeling, but also promotes tumor growth metastases. So again, where can we Im impact these with these sorts of repurposed therapies to uh, counteract these effects of the injury response? And here's just a, a simple list of potential targets. Um, dying or dead tumor cells uh, release adenosine. So we could ad address this by using drugs like caffeine. Platelet activation uh, can be counteracted with use of NSAIDs or, or clopidogrel or other uh, anti-platelet therapies. Histamine release, very simply histamine blockers. A catecholamine release, uh, beta blockers, for instance. And then immune activation is the whole slew of, of agents that could alter the immune response to uh, to tumor growth. Again, this uh, immune response, the goal of the immune response, of course, is to reverse this tumor-induced immunosuppression that results from tumor growth. And so the, 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 the goal of this is to reduce tumor burden, to, of course, kill tumor cells or remove them physically or radiate them, um, to reduce the production of or cytokines or, or catecholamines from the tumor cell and the injury response that results because of it. We can neutralize uh, soluble factors and cytokines, metabolites. These are all uh, that factors that result from tumor growth or tumor death and impact the uh, su suppressor cell populations like MDSCs and Tregs. 
to uh, potentiate the immune response. And then of course the danger single signals in the tumor vicinity, which, which alter the body's response to, to tumor growth. And so there are a slew of potential targets that we could use anywhere along this adaptive, the immune or the injury responses to, to again, alter the current therapies that we have and the, the, the tumor death that results because of them. So we're left with this sort of elephant in the room there are a lot of potential therapies, most of which are very inexpensive, but there's really no interest in pursuing them, at least interest from a financial perspective, interest from a, um, a, a collaborative need to bring these therapies to large patient populations to really determine if they're going to alter uh, our ability to, to provide cancer control. And so this is where the Morningside Center for Innovative and Affordable Medicine comes in. It is our mission to develop practice-changing treatments that are effective, affordable, and non-toxic. So how are we going to do this? We're, the plan is to adopt financial orphans. In other words, pursue scientifically promising ideas that are lying fallow due to this lack of financial incentive. And how are we, what, how are we gonna do this? What's the plan to do this? Um, we'll initially focus on cancer, although we, we plan on uh, branching out to, to more, uh, to other, other uh, disease topics as well. We're going to identify and prioritize these financial orphans and design studies and identify PIs and fund the clinical studies to determine if there actually is a signal with, with these drugs. We're going to fund critical preclinical experiments to advance ideas that aren't yet ready for clinical studies. And the goal is to publish data that influences treatment guidelines. Uh, ultimately, to say, if you're a community practitioner, that the addition of this repurposed drug is safe, non-toxic, and actually impacts uh, disease progression or survival. <clears throat> and then develop novel study designs. This is, it's becoming very apparent with our team that it's going to require uh, the buy-in from large communities of patients to, to really actually change the way that we're, we're, that we're providing these therapies. And it's gonna require a fair amount of funding to be able to do that. And so that's gonna require advocacy and education efforts regionally, nationally, and globally uh, to bring both investigators and patients to these ideas. And we value laser sharp focus on patient benefit and safety. Safety is really important. We need to make sure that the addition of these drugs isn't in, in, in fact uh, affecting uh, toxicity and is providing some benefit. And we're, we're open-minded to any idea, however unusual, and, and, and hopefully you'll, by the end of this, understand that any idea that you or one of your colleagues has is a, is a real and a legitimate idea, and, and we're willing to consider it and move it forward. So why now? Uh, the main reason uh, is because this is becoming a topic of interest across the world. There's this omics revolution, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, genomics, epigenomics, um, and, and, uh, and these new uh, omics are really impacting the, our ability to diagnose and treat cancers. There's big data. With these omics is coming big data. Um, we can find new drug candidates. We can develop new study methods. We can combine um, uh, therapies because of our ability to process big data. The technology of single cell sequencing and other uh, real world investigations in a translational setting can really change uh, which study population we can focus on um, to really enrich which patients may benefit from these drugs. And then of course, patients, engaging patients. Patients want to know what they can do, what they, how they can help, what simple, easy drugs they can take from home without coming to visit their practitioner to add to their cancer regimen to really see an impact. If you can put a patient on propanolol and they can check their blood pressure at home and their heart rate at home, they don't have to come in for a visit with their, with their oncologist to make sure that they're not experiencing a toxicity from the drug. They're gonna be much more engaged in, in the process of, of repurposing drugs. So these are our main work streams. Um, these really help us focus on how we can bring therapies to patients. And so I'm gonna work through these sequentially because they really build on each other. The first is, is that we're developing a database that I think will, will provide practitioners 
a, a, a access to large um, uh, information that can help them design studies. And then once we think about what ideas may work, we can prioritize them in terms of a framework or a, a priority where they fit into different disease sites. We, then we look for epidemiologic and preclinical studies to support moving forward with uh, an idea. And then of course we move it to patients in clinical trials. And then as we develop clinical trials, we think about other ways to bring uh, therapies to patients with novel study design, window of opportunity studies, distributive studies, those sorts of ways of, of bringing these ideas to more than just the patients that walk through our door here at Winship. And then of course, reaching out to uh, patients and partners in the community, um, educating them so that we can bring these therapies to more patients. So I'm, I'm excited to debut our disease specific database on behalf of the team. The opportunity here is to really change the way that we refine data on repurposed drugs. Um, it's often time consuming and inefficient. Uh, PubMed is not as easy to navigate as we'd hope. Uh, the Morningside Center database makes aims to make this process easier for all of us by providing a readily accessible drug database categorized by disease. And the impact is real. The potential is to organize this data by disease to, so that you as investigators can design clinical studies and know exactly what data is available. So this is our database and, and, and major kudos to, to Vigila, Krista and Selvi for their immense amount of work that they, they put into this database. Um, as I'm about to, to demo to you, you'll see exactly uh, every single one of these studies that was entered into the data database was hand annotated and reviewed um, and, and, and put into this database by category. And so I'm excited if it works to show you how this database works. So this is the Remedy Cancer. This is accessible within the Emory VDT. Um, and, um, and the link was provided in the, in the database. We're still rolling this out. So patients, if you do try it, we can enter the search page, we can find a clinical trial, we can search by disease. Let's pick colorectal, because I know Basil Reyes is on the call. And let's pick um, this second trial. This is a, a randomized phase two trial, uh, looking at this NSAID. And this database is designed so that you can see uh, the, the dosage that was given, the concurrent therapy, the number of patients enrolled, the brief overview of the results of the trial. And then the Morningside Center has created a summary of the trial that we think includes the relevant data. You can also click on the study itself and pro you're provided additional information about the study, including the PubMed abstract, uh, a link directly to the PubMed and the clinicaltrials.gov screen. So this, we hope, uh, will be a, a really useful resource to investigators as they're thinking about what potential targets would exist within repurposing in a single source. The other really uh, interesting um, use for this database is us as, in, as Morningside Center bringing this database to each of the disease sites. So look out for us um, in a good way, I hope. Um, we're gonna be bringing our database to you and saying, help us think through these 48 different studies in, in colorectal cancer and, and help us design the next most relevant, important study within your disease group that we can help you start uh, and bring to patients. So I provided additional screenshots in case I couldn't get into the database. So after we um, use the database, hopefully to, to bring new ideas to the table, we have to develop some sort of prioritization of these studies. And so we've developed a framework for this. It's, it's pretty straightforward and, and it's relatively um, uh, obvious in its need to, to prioritize studies. How does this fit within the scientific framework? Um, what is the level of evidence supporting the data, human data versus cell culture data in a spectrum? What is the affected, uh, anticipated effect size and the toxicity? Are there biomarkers that exist that we could use to determine which patients may benefit uh, from this therapy more than others? Um, how many patients could be impacted by this? Is it a rare tumor, a non-rare tumor? Uh, impact across cancer types? Um, and will we actually learn something if the trial fails? And then there are other non-scientific factors, of course. How expensive is it? 
how, how feasible is it? Um, how interested are the, the MDs in, in bringing this out? And then the novelty of the approach. So once we prioritize our ideas, we next turn to epidemiologic and preclinical data. Um, th this is an example of, of Morningside supported epidemiologic work that's been uh, performed by the lung cancer team at the VA. This has been an incredible collaboration uh, of, and a really robust uh, scientific inquiry that has been a really fruitful investigation, we think. And so the purpose of this was to collaborate with the VA team to leverage their large VA electronic health record system to conduct retrospective studies to investigate different medications that may affect outcomes. The strength of this is its size, the ability to combine medications, statins with beta blockers, as opposed to just patients that got beta blockers. The impact is, is potential to um, drive the design of actual clinical trials based on these epidemiologic uh, results. This research team was granted access to over 70,000 veterans treated for non-small cell lung cancer since 2010. Uh, we're analyzing a large swath of different medications. Um, and this slide is courtesy of Bill Stokes and the team at the VA, who again done a tremendous amount of work. Um, this is all of the different therapies that they've interrogated in patients with non-small cell lung cancer since 2010. Um, you can see that early on in the process, we, we started um, seeing really no uh, effect with some of these repurposed drugs. But the more we interrogated, the more we were able to um, see in a retrospective fashion, of course, some association between these, these drugs and cancer care when, when given with immunotherapy. And this work has resulted in five abstracts being accepted at, at international meetings. Um, and I might uh, add that uh, this epidemiologic data in the, with the use of diclofenac and immunotherapy in, in non-small cell lung cancer has resulted in the development of a clinical trial that we're, we're uh, getting ready to open. So now I'm going to focus on the meat of the work of the, of the Morningside Center, and that is the, the clinical work. There are three current open trials at, that the Morningside Center is, is um, funding. These are phase one, phase two studies in both local, regional, and metastatic disease. The typical funding range is somewhere between $150,000 and $350,000. But the expectation is that the clinical work will resu result in extramural funding to support uh, a lot of the correlative studies, which really drive um, why and how these medications work together. The studies uh, are being led by Viraj, Basil, and uh, Basil, and I'll go through them in a bit more detail uh, here. The first study to open uh, is being led by Viraj Master. Um, this is a pilot study of uh, safety for pre-incisional catorolac in patients undergoing uh, resection of either non-small cell lung cancer or renal cell carcinoma. The rationale behind this study is that surgical trauma, again, that injury response increases the production of prostaglandins and thromboxanes, which promote tumor growth and have immunosuppressive entities, and we think contribute to the development of tumor recurrence after surgical removal of the tumors. So the rationale is that administration or the hypothesis is that administration of NSAIDs prior to surgery may reverse these effects. The intervention is a single dose of 30 milligrams of Ketorolac 30 minutes prior to incision. The primary uh, endpoint of this study is, is safety. And the main reason for that is this uh, fear uh, in the eyes of surgeons that preoperative anticoagulation can alter the risk of surgical bleeding postoperatively. There are a fair amount of data that, that is antithesis to that theory, but it really, uh, on Viraj's uh, astute observation, is going to take a trial designed as a safety endpoint with a safety endpoint to show that this intervention is actually safe. However, there are also a significant amount of exploratory correlatives and efficacy endpoints that will show whether or not this intervention is actually ch changing the uh, circulating and tumor specific environments, but also whether or not uh, these changes correlate with the presence of recurrences. The impact is to really establish the safety of preoperative NSAIDs to justify a larger clinical trial that will establish efficacy. So a study update for this study, um, the goal accrual is 76 patients split evenly between RCC and lung. 
Um, 249 patients have been screened and thus far 23 patients have been enrolled and I can, I think, safely say um, proceeded safely to surgery and recovered safely as well. The second study is a study in the pancreas cancer space being led by Basil Reyes. This is a trial of paracalcitol and hydroxychloroquine in combination with gemcitabine and paclitaxel in advanced pancreas cancer. The rationale for this study is that the engagement of the vitamin D receptor by uh, vitamin D receptor agonists, particularly paracalcitol, shifts fibroblasts in the tumor microenvironment toward a more quiescent phenotype and therefore reduces tumor growth and improves the penetration of the concomitant chemotherapy into the tumor microenvironment. Autophagy um, is sort of a buzzword in cancer now, as is hydroxychloroquine in medicine in general, but it's a common mechanism that cancer cells use to avoid chemotherapy. And the inhibition of this autophagy with hydroxychloroquine um, has been shown to increase response to chemotherapy, particularly in pancreas cancer. This study is actually really um, based on two case reports of patients that have, an, have had an incredible long-term response to this combination um, with or without another intervention that uh, is actually so incredibly unexpected that it really piqued our interest in terms of a combination intervention. So the nature of this intervention is to pre-treat patients with this uh, vitamin D analog and hydroxychloroquine prior to starting chemotherapy. Uh, the primary outcome is anti-tumor effects as measured by the objective response rate. <clears throat> and the impact here is to add to the increasing literature that vitamin D analogs and, and autophagy agents, uh, inhibition agents, um, will really change the way that we can uh, impact the use of chemotherapy. So this is the study schema for this uh, trial. Patients are enrolled and start on um, paracalcitol and hydroxychloroquine pre-chemotherapy, and then combination therapy um, for the duration of the cycle. This is some preclinical data shared uh, with me by Basil Reyes. This is unpublished and confidential, but I wanna highlight the incredible work uh, that they've done in the preclinical setting to really demonstrate the combination of um, gemcitabine, hydroxychloroquine, and paracalcitol in reducing tumor burden in a KPC uh, cell line model. Similar data showing the actual raw data from, from mice showing a significant decrease in tumor, uh, tumor weight when the combination therapy is given compared to controls. So in terms of a study update for this study, the goal accrual is 21 patients, 10 patients have been screened and six patients have been enrolled. This is additional data uh, shared with me by Manaj Basin. This is also unpublished. The, his team has done some incredible single cell sequencing work. This is data showing baseline and treated specimens. Uh, again, single cell sequencing in a UMAP uh, plot showing a significant reduction in the number of pancreas cancer uh, cells and an increase in the number of T cells. In, in a bit more raw data, you can show, see here the blue lines being baseline and the, and the orange lines being uh, treated cells, that the number of uh, pancreas uh, cells, pancreas cancer cells decreases and the number of T cells increase in human uh, samples that are treated with this combination. The overall theme thus far is that, uh, that this treatment regimen reduces PDAC cells and increases T cells. And this is some, again, uh, flow-based uh, study showing that this treatment increases cytotoxic T cell markers uh, in addition to the overall T cell population. The next study that has just opened uh, is a study being led by the GU team, Basil Naza. This is propanolol in combination with pembrolizumab in patients with urothelial cancers. The, the, the rationale here is that beta adrenergic singling um, increases or, or can influence this MDSC population um, and impact a catecholamine drive driven um, cell growth. And so this is also based on a fair amount of retrospective data. This is a dose escalation of propanolol in combination with pembrolizumab in first or second line advanced urothelia or bladder cell. Um, we've actually adopted this. I apologize. This I, I pulled the slide from an older slide deck. 
Um, this is actually going to be a defined dose uh, phase two study evaluating the objective response rates uh, with this combination. So congratulations to Basil to, for just opening this study and we look forward to hearing that the first patient has been enrolled. A trial just about to open is, is one of our most um, cutting edge trials. This is a single arm pilot study evaluating the safety and feasibility of inducing a hypothyroxemic state in patients with recurrent GBM. Um, this, this, this trial is being led by Dr. Volotion, one of our endocrinology colleagues. Um, the rationale here is that T4, we think, has angiogenic and oncogenic effects, while T3 may have pro-immune properties and pro-differentiation properties. And this is based on uh, a fair amount of preclinical data and a small patient case series. Uh, the intervention here for hypothyroid patients is to switch them from T4 to T3 at the initiation of chemotherapy in the refractory GBM setting. But again, the more groundbreaking part of the study is if a euthyroid patient comes in and has refractory GBM, we're actually going to induce hypothyroidism with methimazole, create a hypothyroid state, and when they're sufficiently hypothyroid, um, while concomitantly treating with chemotherapy, treat with T3 instead of T4. And the primary outcome here is really the safety and tolerability of inducing this hypothyroid state in, th in euthyroid patients, and then the combination of chemotherapy and T3. This uh, study is under the process of, of regulatory review as we speak. We have uh, several clinical trials that are in the process of, of development. Um, these are in various stages. One of them is, is the replacement, again, of this T3 instead of T4 when patients become hypothyroid on immune check blockade. In other words, a patient is on immune checkpoint blockade, they become hypothyroid as a side effect of their immune check, checkpoint blockade, and we initiate T3 instead of T4. Another study uh, combining um, the very commonly used drug Compazine to improve uh, the efficacy of trastuzumab. Uh, there is data suggesting that uh, Compazine actually uh, prevents the endocytosis of the HER2 um, uh, extracellular uh, signaling. And if we reverse that endocytosis, there's additional HER2 availability for binding by trastuzumab. So we're in the process of developing an assay that will actually analyze the amount of, of HER2 expression on cells in the presence of composine in an animal model before we bring that forward to humans. Uh, there is, again, a growing body of literature supporting the role of statins in cancer therapy. Um, and the breast team is bringing forward a proposal of neoadjuvant simvastatin and latrozole um, in hormone-positive breast cancer prior to surgery. And then I'd like to highlight this study of diclofenac in immunotherapy and metastatic lung cancer. This trial is, is, is close to um, regulatory review with the help of Jenny Carlisle. Um, this study really is the result of a fair amount of preclinical data supporting the use of NSAIDs and immunotherapy combinations but also the result of the epidemiologic data from the VA that showed that diclofenac is associated with improved survival when given with immunotherapy. We're also um, on the lookout for multi-institutional studies across the country. Uh, this is one that was brought to us by Roswell Park. Again, the use of propanolol with um, immunotherapy in stage uh, four melanoma. This is a study that's based on a phase one study run by the Roswell Park team in which they showed that the <clears throat> combination of propanolol and prembolizumab was safe and had a response rate of about 70% in the combination, the up treatment setting, um, which is just an astounding number in a small number of patients, but certainly argues for this being evaluated in a, in a larger phase two study with which we hope to participate. I also want to touch briefly on um, the, the, the Sukatme's work in the COVID-19 platform. We recently joined the iSpy COVID trial because of the hard work of, of Vikas and Vigila. Um, this is an adaptive platform trial design similar to the iSpy that we participate in in breast cancer. And the goal is to rapidly screen high impact treatments uh, for critically ill COVID patients. This is the schema. Um, patients enroll randomized to a backbone of drugs plus specific treatments and you get a very early readout about which therapy should go or not go. And if there is no signal or toxicity, 
we just add a new drug, add a new combination of drugs. And if there is some signal, we continue to put patients into that arm um, as opposed to predetermining the number of patients that should fit into any given arm of the trial. So that takes me to this novel study design idea. Um, there, there needs to be a way of bringing these concepts to more patients and to get through a large array of therapies uh, without designing a single study in a single disease with a single drug over and over and over again. And so we have to be adaptive in our strategies to bring these therapies to, um, to in, in more of a, uh, a new novel study design so that we can test more therapies with fewer numbers of patients. So one of the ways of doing that is window of opportunity studies. So these are treatment naive patients typically in which we give a therapy pre-surgery and it gives us an immediate access to tissue and blood to compare differences pre and post treatment in both blood and tissue. We get a quick efficacy readout as well by assessing response. There are also late st stage uh, trial ideas. These are typically refractory patients that are in phase one studies where we could give a brief course of a therapy in this washout period between phase one studies and get a real, uh, real sense of whether or not we're seeing any biologic changes by adding these drugs, even as patients are just simply waiting to go from one phase one study to another. So lastly, I wanna focus on uh, advocacy, education and outreach. I'm proud to announce, um, this is not the first announcement of course, that we have successfully funded um, six investigators in preclinical biomarker and clinical trial um, that we recently announced. Uh, the, the total amount awarded across uh, six studies was 955,000 in three buckets of preclinical biomarker and clinical trial work. Um, the letter of intent call um, resulted in four, 14 letters. We extended an invitation for 10 full proposals and six awards were just given this past week. So very briefly, um, these are four of the preclinical uh, concepts that were that were awarded. Um, congratulations to, to Greg Lazinski, Ned Waller, Nicole Schmidt, and Renee Reed. Uh, I look forward to, uh, to seeing the great work that, that you're bringing forward to, to Morningside and, and our ideas. There was one biomarker study that was um, funded by uh, Laura McCullough and um, one clinical trial design funded for Andrew Hendrick. This is the first uh, foray, if you will, of the Morning Test Center outside of, of the cancer space. And this is a study looking at diabetic retinopathy. Um, and so we're excited to expand our horizons um, to non-cancer uh, ideas, preclinical work, and clinical trials as well. So the next, I turn to partnership. Uh, this, this is a, a task that's not doable simply within the confines of Winship. Um, I am grateful to have met uh, Lynn Durham and have worked in Cheryl Gabram in her new role um, as Chief Scientific Officer of Georgia Corps. Uh, they've been incredible partners historically under the leadership of Nancy Parrish. And we look forward to continuing this collaboration um, as, as Lynn and Cheryl really work towards bringing clinical trials like uh, the Morningside Center's trial to the community. And we're, we're interested they're interested in collaborating with us on Basil Naha's trial of propanol and pembrolizumab in urothelial cancer. So we're actually working on a budget to bring them into that trial, but we look forward to bringing um, Georgia Corps and, and the other centers across the state of Georgia that work with Georgia Corps into our other trials. Again, a lot of these studies require um, a large patient population and, uh, and are best interrogated in the, in the treatment naive setting. And as a lot of the investigators on this call know, uh, <clears throat> treatment naive patients aren't readily available within the, within the Winship space because of the referral patterns into the system. And so uh, a lot of this work needs to be brought to the community. And it's really exciting to have people like Lynn and Cheryl reach out to community partners, uh, gauge their interest, um, and bring those partners uh, in collaboration with us to, to give their, them and their patients access to some of these uh, novel trial concepts. 
but we also need to, to spread our wings further. We need to spread them regionally to reach out to specific partners, particularly partners aligned with Winship, particularly Northeast Georgia Health System. <coughs> Excuse me, we need to bring these concepts to cooperative groups, ECOG and SWAG, potentially even building a committee within ECOG that focuses exclusively on repurposed drugs. There needs to be federal buy-in, um, from, particularly from NCATS. And then this idea of building a consortium with partners across the academic world, um, like-minded individuals who want to repurpose drugs, bringing all of these repurposed teams together to, um, to really build a consortium where we can turn to these other 10, 15, 20 institutions and say, here's our next trial concept. Are you on board that we already have in the infrastructure in place to, to run trials across institutions? So in closing, uh, there are a lot of challenges to this work, uh, idea generation and prioritization, which ideas are gonna work, which ideas aren't. We need rapid feedback so we know which ideas to bring forward. We need to develop biomarkers that will, will result in an early go, no-go readout. We need to recruit investigators who are willing to work with us to bring these concepts to patients. We need patients. You know, this is this is only possible um, because of, of the willingness of patients to to think outside the box, to to bring new ideas, uh, safe, inexpensive new ideas to their cancer care. All of this needs to be funded somehow. Philanthropy is has done an incredible start, but we need to go big. Um, and of course, the inability to perform large phase three trials. This is the only way to really bring these therapies into the mainstream is to say that they actually show uh, a, a efficacious impact on cancer therapy. So the solution in our mind is to engage on an institutional, regional, national, and federal level to bring everybody on board to bring these ideas to our patients. So how are we measuring success within the, the Morningside Center? Um, really, the ultimate goal here is to develop studies that change the standard of care. We're also looking to launch a solid number of trials um, in some sort of adaptive design to bring as many patients as we can to these therapies. The number of trials completed, even if it's negative, number of patients enrolled, the number of publications that we're able to put out, the number of grants received in addition to the funding provided by Morningside, um, the implementation of the database I showed you to bring new ideas into, into clinical trials, real world design studies, um, the creation of this consortium or other collaborative spaces that we can bring these trials to, particularly ECOG and SWOG. And again, our overarching goal is to provide evidence to change practice. We bring these therapies into the standard of care so that anybody across the country, not just in academia, not just at Winship, can give their patients these safe, non-toxic, um, and hopefully efficacious drugs to improve their outcomes. And so with that, I'm, I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for the energy that, that comes with this team at Morningside Center. Uh, and we hope to bring this energy to you in each of your disease sites um, and, and really, again, bring these therapies to our patients and improve their outcomes. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to, to take any questions from, from anyone. Thank you so much, Mike. I, I think Morningside was a little black box for me, so I appreciate your enlightening me and taking off your melanoma hat um, and, and letting us know all that you're doing. So if you have any questions, please use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. I would like to mention that next week we have Dr. Paul Klutz from the FDA, who will be presenting Crossing the Finish Line, Generating Evidence for FDA Cancer Drug Approval. So I think that's a great lecture to follow your lecture um, for next week. So, so be sure to tune in next week. And let's get to the questions. So we have a few questions already in the inbox. Um, Dr. Harvey asked about using these drugs to really develop other targeted agents, similar to what happened with valproic acid leading to varinostat. Is the morning side looking at how do we evolve the 
drugs um, and get IP to develop other anti-cancer agents, or are you more concentrating on just using them directly as anti-cancer agents? Yeah, the great question, Don, I, and I know you're not on anymore, um, but this is this is one of the strategic discussions that we have frequently. Um, that's a whole nother, a whole nother line of inquiry um, that would require a, a really thoughtful team of chemists, phar pharmacists. Um, it's a different avenue of investigation. And, and we have thus far really been focused on taking drugs that we know are already available, FDA approved, and um, readily accessible to clinicians to bring them to patients um, because of the amount of infrastructure would require to develop new drugs as a repurposed drug. We really have been solely focusing on readily available FDA approved drugs. A few other questions. Um, are you looking at natural compounds um, as well or mainly focused on the drug development? So the natural compounds, and this sort of also gets to Dr. Lawson's question of, of lifestyle modifications, that there is, there is, it is exceedingly difficult to objectively assess nutraceuticals um, and lifestyle modifications and compliance with those therapies, um, the, the amount of nutraceutical in any given formulation. Um, we are interested in pursuing those lines of, 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 of investigation, um, but it's, it's a whole nother ball game. It requires, again, a whole nother set of specialists in in um, non-inter, non-medical therapy, um, but we are certainly investigating. And, and Dr. Lawson, to your, to your point, a little bit uh, more in depth. Um, one of our, as an example, one of our preclinical studies that we've just funded um, is asking questions about um, the amount of adipose tissue and how that affects the 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 efficacy of some of these repurposed drugs. And so it's these sort of very basic concepts of body composition and evaluating body composition um, and, and, and the amount of adipose tissue that will allow us to say whether or not lifestyle modifications will actually be impactful. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that was great. Um, I have another question. So we, you know, you talked about some of the challenges and getting this developed and one of them at least is often clinician time to, to develop the protocol or to get the collaboration. Um, for example, your thyroid studies from endocrinology and other fields that we may need to dedicate to this. Has, I always say we get percent effort, we get all these things to, to protect our time once the study's open. But it's really all the work that goes in beforehand that makes that successful. And I always say, I think I spend more time there than once patients are on. Um, is there any thought given to how to prioritize that portion, especially um, for these that are, are a lot are investigator initiated trials that require a lot from the, the development standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're, we're dedicated to helping as much as we can um, to get investigators towards opening trials. I, as an investigator, understand the burden it, on us in, in context of our clinical responsibilities and our other research, the other research portfolio um, to, to take an idea that we say, hey, wouldn't it be great to add propanolol to pembrolizumab in treatment naive stage four melanoma? Great, go. It's a, that's a, it's a big ask on, on our part to you as an investigator. And so we are dedicated as a center and open to ideas to bring as many resources as possible to investigators to go from an idea that you create or we create into a real clinical trial. We've, we've um, collaborated with people from Upworks. We've reached outside of the institution to get protocol writers. Um, we've, we've gotten st statisticians to help assist in the design of studies. Um, so yes, we, our goal is to assist investigators in whatever capacity they need to, again, get your idea to a trial or for us to present an idea to you as an investigator and work with you to get it to, to an actual trial that's accessible to a patient. Awesome. Um, 
Dr. Ramalingam talks about engaging patient advocates, you know, since this is really patient-centered work, trying to give more readily accessible drugs, it, it might really be a, um, these trials probably need the patient advocacy and the design even more so. Has there been thought put, or is that already part of the development of some of these trials? It is peripherally, and Ram, thanks for that that comment and suggestion. Is it is exceedingly crucial to engage the patient advocates. I, I can, I will say that the majority of these drugs um, are are easily accessible and well tolerated. So the the burden on the patient is is likely to be less than that of other novel therapies that we're bringing to our patients. Um, but whenever we have have ideas like this, you're absolutely right. The patient advocate is really the most, one of the most important people in making sure that, that we're taking the patient's needs into consideration when, when bringing our ideas to them. So it is 8.30, I think I'll, we'll do one more question. So sorry, there's a lot of questions in the question and answer. I don't know if Mike, you can um, think about reaching out to these uh, investigators directly. But one last question, how do you design these? This is a, something we've talked about, I know, where patients are already on many of these drugs on their own. So how do you control for that? People on NSAIDs are ready for, for other reasons and you're trying to, to get them on a study where it's done in a more controlled fashion. Yeah, so unfortunately, a lot of this a lot of this requires us to, to exclude patients that are already on some of these drugs. This is really the power of the epidemiologic data coming from the VA. We can actually interrogate when we have 70,000 patients, when these patients were on any one of these drugs. We can look back six years, we can look back six months, we can look back six days. When did they start their therapy in relationship to when their immunotherapy started and see if the timing of these drugs impacts um, the, the actual cancer therapy. So that's one, one way that we can really investigate the timing of some of these drugs that patients are already on. But if we want to really ask, does the addition of a drug um, change the therapy, the efficacy of the therapy, it requires most patients to not be on them. And if we find a result, for instance, we found in the VA database that antibiotics um, are, have a significant negative act on the effect of the immunotherapy, we have to reconsider whether or not patients should be taken off of them um, when we initiate cancer therapies. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, um, it unfortunately requires us to be somewhat selective in the patient population we're choosing, particularly when we're evaluating early safety tolerability data to see whether or not this should move forward to a bigger study. Well, we so appreciate your time. Um, and I'm sorry for those that we didn't get to your questions. We'll, we'll try to reach out to you guys directly. And um, Dr. Lowe, thank you for coming and look forward uh, to all the program we'll do for our patients in the future. Thank you for the invitation. It's been, a, it's been an honor.